So I will start now. I'm recording it. So and now the, here's Dr. Silky who will present about the introduction of our site. Hi, my name is Ken Stokey, uh, but I answer to Stoko and all kinds of different variations, no problem. Uh, uh, PI of the site, you'll see in a moment. And uh, Brady Cox, please chime in anytime you want, Brady, about, you know, maybe if there are other comments you'd like to make about this little part, no big deal. Because uh, we're just trying to uh, let the folks know what the equipment's like and uh, what they might be able to use. Okay, next, please. So if you look at this, there are seven equipment sites, and then there are various other uh, NERI, Network for Her Hazard Engineering Re Research Infrastructure, uh, and that you can work with. Uh, we're just uh, one, but you see that we're a field shakers, and so we're a mobile site. We typically go out in the field. In fact, uh, we always go out in the field. And I can't think of a time when we have it with this equipment, of course. Next. Okay. I have, oh, yes. Sorry. Uh, so this is for you so that you can see Giovanna Viscontine. Would you put a little cursor up there? Yeah. Giovanna Viscontine or Joy Powski are the two, one, both that you can send your pre-proposal to. I had forgotten, by the way, that it was one page, but it's very important about the topic and so forth. They need to see what might be coming and they have to prepare for it because there's such a short time fuse on what's going on. I don't know that you can estimate a budget because that's awful soon because they would like that one page uh, overview before Christmas. In fact, they wanted it by today, but we couldn't get the workshop ready by today because of other problems. So they want it certainly so they can uh, assemble folks to see what looks as reasonable things to move forward with. And then I, I guess at that point, they'll let you know. Next. Okay. Go ahead, Brady, were you gonna say something? Nobody, okay, I just thought I heard someone. Okay, Stokey, then uh, Brady Cox there, uh, you see him. Another co-PI is Patricia Clayton. Another one is uh, Bob Gilbert, the chairman of our civil engineering department. Uh, you see the operations manager, Sung Moon right here. Uh, IT and cybersecurity, Robert Kent. Uh, and uh, we have a project support and liaison with NSF, which is Fan Yu Meng. You see our two operators of the machines down there, uh, Andrew Valentine and Alito Ruiz. And then we have a person that I think started with the people that invented vibrosizes, let's say, uh, Cecil Hallpower. And literally, he's amazing. He can walk up to the machine and tell if it's running properly or not. Uh, he is extremely valuable to us. Next. Okay, so you see we have many pieces of equipment, five large shakers, and T-Rex is the one in the upper left-hand corner there. You see it weighs 64,000 pounds. So moving it around in Hawaii can be challenging, and that would be one of the problems that, that we have to look into. It's it, for us on the big island, it is a challenging effort right now. Um, Let me check the T-Rex up below to how it's going back and get that. Uh, is that, is that, go ahead, say that out loud. What is it was? Yeah, so the moving the T-Rex from the Hilo to Ohio for uh, uh, what example, it will take like 4,500. Okay, yeah, I asked you to look that up, huh? Correct. Yeah, good. So, so Sangwon just told you, moving it from one island to another, that's $4,500 more or less. Um, and it's a first guess. Okay, what you also see here on the bottom besides, the, that's okay, we can go, no problem. Because we'll see in a minute. Okay, so here's T-Rex, and it tells you a little bit more about the triaxial shaper, shaker. You know, it's e for the operators, it's reasonably easy to use uh, as long as it's working well. 
Um, you see it weighs 64,000 pounds. When we demonstrate it to little kids at school, the only thing they care about is how tall they are compared to the tires. Uh, that's a big deal to them. But you see here in pink on the right-hand side, the vertical force versus frequency plot and below the horizontal forces versus the frequency plot. Are you gonna show the horizontal shaking? Yes. I think this is Brady's. Brady, isn't that yours? Yeah, this is a video I took in, in uh, New Zealand, near, near Portland. Oh, this uh -huh. is, yeah. It's, it's not coming across awesome on the, uh, the feed, but you can see the plywood moving. <laughs> yeah, and you can see the ground moving. Yeah, that's a very nice one. Thank you. Uh, and in, we will have support vehicles. You, they were all in that uh, first slide that showed all the equipment. But you see that I've identified in Hawaii, uh, we'll have the field fuel truck, because uh, we'll have to go get fuel for T-Rex. Um, it's too expensive to have it delivered. Uh, and you'll see the trailer. It's a, it's a Equipment trailer, it has air conditioned space, it has electrical power uh, in the front half, let's say, and then in the back half, it has a lot of equipment that we'll be bringing over. And uh, some of the equipment that we'll be bringing over may depend on what uh, funding you guys out there get and what you need. Next. So this just shows you the inside of the trailer and the instrumentation I am not gonna describe, but you see 72 channels there, 24 bit digitizer, up to 50 kilohertz sampling rate and so forth. And are you gonna to admit to it, Brady? That's Brady a long time ago. Okay, in the upper picture. Now, Sung Moon isn't laughing too much because this is Sung Moon in the lower picture that. Uh, not that long ago, is it? Is uh, it? But out in the field, yep. Yeah, but you see some more, some more, uh, you know, digitization equipment and so forth. And you just see the characteristics. And I mean, to describe all of them, I think is sort of a waste of time. But the information is there if you need it in your proposal, which that's up to you. Next. Now, Brady will talk about the DAS interrogator. And that's something new that we have. And he's got a whole 20 minutes to show how he's used it. Um, and th that's, uh, well, we'll wait and see. But I mean, uh, that's a special piece of equipment too that's not cheap. And you see it's new on the upper up here. Uh, you see 2021 is when we got it. So we, that's a new piece of equipment that we were that we have to offer now. Peace, next please. And this just shows you various types of equipment. Here's 109, let's just say 101 hertz geophones um, and with lots of cable, shielded cable and so forth. Uh, you see four and a half hertz geophones out there, about 224 channels and blah, blah, blah of, of equipment to record next. Uh, these are reasonably new three component nodal geophones uh, that 100 smart solo uh, three component nodal stations uh, that are available. And by the way, on, you can't go on the, um, on the volcano. Uh, and I think we put that in the advertisement, but you, the reason this came out is you see the spikes on the bottom of those, you can't use any spikes on, to, on the volcano. You can't poke anything into it. Uh, I don't know if it gets mad at you and erupts, but uh, let, just for the record. So in some cases, I don't know if this is gonna be uh, true in other places, but uh, that was a surprise to me, no problem. Next. Okay, we have broadband seismometers and so forth. Uh, is that a picture from you too, Brady? I, isn't that yeah? Um, I don't yeah, this is this is at Los Alamos National oh, Lab. Exactly, uh, Los Alamos. That's what I thought. Um, next, please. And you know, on the back of I didn't point it out when we had all the equipment up there, but on the back of uh, T Rex and Liquidator, we have the ability. We have a, a hydraulic cylinder there, and we can push equipment into the ground. We do that routinely. Um, 
and you see cone penetrometers, you see custom made. So we've got liquefaction sensors that we built uh, with MEMS accelerometers and two and three G geophones that are 28 Hertz. Yes. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, that, that, uh, that we then can do cross hole, down hole testing and so forth. Uh, or if you shake the ground, make measurements at depth with these sensors in, and we've done a lot of that in New Zealand. Uh, next. Just a, a shows a bit of where we've been on the mainland. Uh, we started uh, being a, an, an NSF uh, shared use facility network for earthquake engineering simulations. That's that NICE up there, uh, 2003 to 2014. And you see where we worked and you see New Zealand on the right hand side there, one of the yellow uh, symbols working there. And then you also see, by the way, in Hawaii, where Ivan Wong's on, but we use Thumper. Uh, a much smaller machine, uh, much cheaper to get over there and so forth uh, to do uh, site investigations, shear wave velocity profiling at a, a lot of seismic stations. Um, next. Okay, here's an example for you. This is a cost estimate from a recent research proposal that had to be postponed. And it says testing at an attractive island. And we're going to attract the violence. But you might know that a volcano on the big island erupted a couple of years ago, and that could have uh, stopped a project. Well, what you see right here is for that project, the total estimated fuel cost was $4,660. You'd have to pay that. The travel cost, $23,000. That'd be just traveling and housing and so forth. You don't have to pay salaries of, of our folks, but uh, all the other costs, uh, shipping T-Rex on a boat was gonna, T-Rex was going over there. So you see that's 44,500. I think it's more now. Uh, you see the overhead that the University of Texas charges. And so you see that uh, to have that project and probably this project you're talking about, uh, that was $114,000. I suspect we're now up to near 150 or 125,000 yeah, at least. But they don't yeah. need to, to pay that by those shipments. So. Yeah, you don't pay any of it. You, yes, they have to, okay, that- Miami pays. Yeah, well, that. no, that's right. No, no, but you wouldn't have to pay that, obviously. You, you, it, now, what part goes along with your project, you would have to cover costs like this. The fuel costs, you don't have to cover the shipping costs. The shipping cost is done but you have to cover travel costs. Well, it's just gonna be between islands. That's the reason, I think one of the reasons at least, not that's a real, the main reason, but one of the reasons why NSF is interested in seeing if they, there's other work that can be done over there now that we have this, this machine, for instance, that can do lots of different things. Next. That's it? Yes. Well, did I get through in time? Yeah, so I should be yeah. more or, or less. Oh, sorry, there's one more. Okay. Um, yeah, no, we'll, 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 you can contact any one of us, and Brady's name should be on there, but he'll show you that when he makes his presentation. Uh, any one of us for, uh, oh, sorry, it is. Um, for additional information or additional help in trying to prepare your proposal. Yes. So. Oh, thanks for the introduction of our site. So <laughs> I think you are yeah, li literally on time. Mm -hmm. The next presentation will be from the uh, the uh, Professor Diamo from the Portland State University and talking about the, the uh, liquefaction mitigation. And I will stop sharing my name. And yes. Are you there, Diane? Yeah. Hi there. Okay. Can you all see my screen okay? Yes. All right. Great. <clears throat> well, I'm going to present on a project that we did back in 2019, um, field trials with uh, the T-Rex shaker truck. And we did this project to evaluate microbially induced desaturation for silt liquefaction mitigation. Um, and I'll get into it um, a bit more, but the reason that we wanted to present this project is that it's, um, it's similar um, in, in that we were able to piggyback or leverage a project already happening in Oregon 
And then also it was collaborative bringing lots of different groups together. Um, so these field trials were performed July to September 2019 in Portland. Um, this is a map here with Portland um, showing uh, the liquefaction susceptibility as estimated by our state's uh, geology agency. Um, the site, we did field trials of MID at two sites, Harborton and Sunderland, um, but the T-Rex testing took place at the Sunderland site, so that's what I'm going to focus on today. Um, we see at this site, it's close to the Portland airport, um, and it's on top of soils deposited by the Columbia River, so young alluvial soils and fine-grained, uh, for which we had a concern about liquefaction. Um, the objectives of this project uh, were to examine MID performance at the field scale, and then also examine its performance in silty soils. Uh, so MID, microbially-induced desaturation, uh, we're interested in this in Portland since there are so many fine-grained soils um, that are concerned for liquefaction, and MID offers us a potentially non-invasive treatment method um, for fine-grained liquefi liquefiable soils. Um, and as well, it's potentially economic compared to other approaches that may be used to mitigate liquefaction hazard of fine-grained soils. Uh, the, the mechanism of MID for liquefaction mitigation is that um, the treatment solution is injected into the subsurface and that treatment solution, it stimulates native denitrifying microbes. That denitrification reaction then produces nitrogen and carbon dioxide gas. That gas displaces pore water and leaves us with a desaturated soil. Um, this image on the right from uh, Sean O'Donnell's uh, PhD work, it shows the remnants of a gas bubble from this MID reaction. And actually this image is from, um, from uh, soil that was uh, treated for MIDP with the P being precipitation. So we can see the calcite precipitation that formed around the gas bubble, thereby allowing us to see this SEM image of the gas. Um, so going a little bit back into the background of desaturated soils and liquefaction, um, on the, the left here, we see kind of that mechanism of mitigating liquefaction. Uh, so from studies of sands and sands with non-plastic fines, we see that as saturation reduces just a small bit from 100%, we start to really suppress the excess pore water pressure generation by cyclic shaking. Um, and that results in an increase of the cyclic strength of the soil and resistance to liquefaction. So on the left here, uh, this work from O'Donnell et al. 2017, we have the cyclic shear ratio versus number of cycles to liquefaction. With 100% saturated sand on the bottom or the lower plot. And then we see that as saturation is reduced from 100% to 99% and 97%, there's a marked increase in the resistance of the soil to liquefaction, um, which can be attributed to the introduction of that, that gas into the pore water or pore fluid. Um, on the right, and this come, becomes important for monitoring uh, the degree of saturation in, in the field, we also see that the pressure wave velocity of the soil, when the soil is quite is nearly fully saturated and 100% saturated, pressure wave velocity is about, well, it's above 1,500 meters per second. Then as we reduce the saturation just a bit, we see a precipitous drop in the um, in the degree of saturation, or sorry, in the P wave velocity of the soil um, down to around 600 meters per second in that range. So our study, the way that we approached it is we wanted to treat the fine grain soil site with microbially induced desaturation, um, and then monitoring the treatment area to evaluate changes in saturation based on primarily the pressure wave velocity, where if we are measuring a pressure wave velocity of about 1500 meters per second, we considered that to be nearly fully saturated. And then when the pressure wave velocity dropped to about 400 meters per second, we considered that saturation to be at least below 98.5%. Um, the second thing that we looked at was with the, the T-Rex mobile shaker was to compare the excess pore water pressure response of the soil um, in untreated to treated soil when those cyclic shear strains from, from the T-Rex shaker truck were imparted on the soil. What we expected was that the pore water pressure of um, excess pore water pressures produced in the treated soil would be notably reduced compared to the untreated soil. Um, and then getting a little bit more background on this project um, with the way that we worked with NSF and then the ongoing project in Portland. Um, this was uh, 
funded through a rapid collaborative grant um, since uh, near at U Texas was already in the Portland area for an ongoing NSF project. Um, and as Dr. Stokey talked about, um, the cost of transportation of T-Rex can be quite, quite high. So with T-Rex already being in the area, we could leverage that um, for this project uh, without those expensive transportation costs or avoiding those expensive transportation costs. Um, the project was also collaborative, bringing together many different um, research groups and uh, local agencies as well. Here in Texas, uh, which contributed the field shaking T-Rex and Thumper, as well as instrumentation. Um, the Center of Biomediated and Bio-Inspired Geotechnics at Arizona State University. We worked with them for the MID design um, and then implementation of the treatment as well as instrumentation. Um, Condon Johnson and Associates, they, they contributed the logistics equipment and developing um, the system for injecting the treatment solution. Contact for the site investigation um, and for doing pressure wave velocity profiles as well with their seismic CPT and access to the site of Portland Bureau of Transportation. So with these agencies and um, partners, as well as many others, this project was possible. Um, so the treatment solution was applied uh, with a layout shown here in the upper right. Um, we fed the treatment solution through an injection well in the center of the treatment area and then extracted groundwater from the four surrounding extraction wells. Uh, and that just helped to encourage migration of the treatment solution through the, the targeted treatment zone, as well as allowed us to use the extracted water to mix the treatment solution and re-inject it through the injection well. Um, what we can focus on here is just the position of the instrumentation um, that was provided by near at U Texas folks. So we have cross hole source rods, and then geophones and pore pressure transducers as well um, in the ground. And then this outline here is the, the footprint of the T-Rex base plate. Uh, our treatment solution was injected over four and a half weeks, like I said, in August, 2019. Uh, this is another view of our treated area and the setup. We have the injection well in the middle, the four extraction wells, and then this cross hole sensor array um, in the middle here between the injection and an extraction well. And the T-Rex would have been parked just behind it over here to, to induce uh, those the cyclic strains into the ground surface, below the ground surface. Um, so as we talked about previously, uh, we're relying on pressure wave velocity to give us an indication of change, changes in saturation. Um, pressure wave velocity was measured um, initially through direct push cross hole techniques uh, to provide a high resolution pretreatment pressure wave velocity profile. Um, we had a cross hole array uh, installed here for regular pressure wave velocity measurements. And these measurements are ongoing. Um, one of our students went out just last week to take the most recent measurement. And then we had seismic CPT measured pressure wave velocity profiles, which gave us um, uh, kind of agile profiles at different points within the site and at different points after the treatment and before. Uh, this is a cross-sectional view of the T-Rex sensor array. Um, we have the cross hole source rods on the left at various depths. Um, our, our motion sensors or accelerometers uh, embedded into the ground to give us, um, to give us a sense of the, the shear strains that are imparted by T-Rex um, and as well, since they're geophones, they um, they do they act as receivers for the the source of the cross hole uh, pressure wave, uh, and then the pore pressure transducers embedded at these various depths as well, and you can see the outline of the TRX base plate at the ground surface. Uh, so this is a figure showing our pressure wave velocity, um, the with the depth on the the y axis, P wave velocity on the x axis. Um, the, the open symbols, both the squares and the circles, those are pretreatment profiles. But the circles being the direct push cross hole, with the nice resolution um, of, our, of our profile. And we can see that inflection here where we go from um, reduced saturation to nearly fully saturated or fully saturated soil at about 2.25 meters. Uh, the squares, those were measured by seismic CPT. And we see that they're. Um, we don't get quite as high of a pressure wave velocity from the seismic CPT 
Um, and we attribute that to um, challenges with attenuation of the wave from the, the ground from the ground source of the pressure wave with seismic CPT. But importantly, we do see this inflection um, at about the same, the same depth as the direct push cross hole profile. The blue symbols, those are our post-treatment values. And what we see there is that across at these various points within the treatment zone, we do see that reduction in P wave velocity um, to a value that indicates that we did successfully desaturate the soil at the site. Uh, the the cross-hole measurements with that installed instrumentation in the ground, those have been very valuable for ongoing measurements. So we can see how long this desaturation is sustaining um, the subsurface. So this, these are data um, from pre-treatment where we see those high pressure wave velocity values, and then that they drop off during treatment indicating that production of biogas and desaturation of the soil and that desaturation has sustained for over three years after the treatment, with this point here being the most recent one that our student Kayla is pictured here doing some outreach um, that she went and took last week. Now looking at our results from the T-Rex shaking, um, these are showing uh, measurements of pore pressures that were produced at about 2.55 meters depth, um, with on the left that being the, the untreated soils and on the right being treated soils plotting excess pore water pressure ratio versus the shear strains um, imparted by T-Rex. And as I said at the beginning, we expected that we would see a reduction in this excess pore water pressure ratio between the untreated and treated soils, but we see pretty similar values um, between untreated and treated. There may be a bit of a difference with this very long shake that was performed by the T-Rex, where we go from about 14% um, excess pore water pressure ratio for those fully saturated soils to about 8% uh, for the, the MIB treated soils. But again, we expected to be able to see it throughout the series of shaking with the T-Rex. Um, and so when we compared the T-Rex shaking results to tests that were done in the lab at UTexas um, on the RCTS device, we see that potentially there needs to be a larger strain level um, imparted in the ground to start to produce um, significant pore water pressures to get that reduction. Where the symbols here of the and the red diamonds and the red crosses, those are showing the RTS results where we do see the notable um, pore water pressures produced versus the T-Rex where we get slightly lower strains and lower pore water pressures. And if we compare those results, both for the RCTS, the blue symbols, and the T-Rex in the green, to some regional data that uh, me and my collaborator, Arash Kosravar, have, um, have, uh, have synthesized over the years from regional projects, uh, we see something where potentially the strains aren't quite large enough to produce those large pore water pressures and then to see that reduction in pore water pressure after treatment. Um, so that brings me to this slide, which is something that we thought of coming out of this project, which is a, a, an approach uh, to, to impart larger cyclic shear strains in the soil at the depth of interest. Since we, we assume that we are seeing attenuation um, from the ground surface shear strains down to depth. Um, and so Dr. Stokey, I believe, did you want to discuss this slide? Well, no, I mean, we've been uh, going to build this for oh, three or four years now, and just haven't gotten around to it because of doing other things, huh? But what the slide shows you is you're going to use an earth anchor, earth anchor, not an auger. We've tried augers, and augers disturb the soil too much. We're going to get an earth anchor. Uh, it won't have that many flights on it. It probably will have half as many. Uh, or maybe three out of the, if I see four there. Um, and the whole idea now is you're gonna move, the deal is moving soil on soil. So that's, uh, you can't do it right there. So right at that vertical line on the, as I look at it on the right hand, yeah, right there. There you're gonna get soil on soil that you're trying to move. That's gonna give you large strains and we can move that anchor much more than, than in a very local area, uh, much more than we can with T-Rex up on the surface. So this is our way 
of trying to get to the deeper depth. We will, we are, we'll see if what comes in to joy, if we need to move fast on this or not. Um, and uh, that this, this, because I've already used a drill shaft long ago to create large strains, T-Rex on top of a drill shaft, vertically shaking. Now it was a, it was a model drill shaft. It was like uh, 15 feet long and 14 inches in diameter, something like that. We were testing that shaft for a, uh, it modeled a dam, uh, sorry, a bridge foundation in California that happened during an earthquake. At any rate, after we did some testing with it, we shook it to see. And what you found is right next to the shaft, strains are huge and they all concentrate right next to the concrete shaft. And you don't get your, your the testing, the, the straining very far away. So this was the next approach to try to get straining going far away or, or some distance away and getting sensors reasonably close. I'll stop there. Uh, if you want to know more, give me a call. Some approach like this to to be able to look at this, the poor water pressures developed at that depth of interest or or TRX doesn't quite impart large enough um, shear strain to to look at the effects of the treatment. But all right, um, and so I think that that's um, all that I I have to show for this project. Um, we used microbially induced desaturation for fine grain liquefiable soil um, to to investigate. Uh, it has a liquefaction mitigation approach. And this was through a collaborative project with Portland State University, near U, Texas, um, Arizona State University, CBBG, and other industry partners. Um, the soils that we treated, we saw that they were successfully desaturated um, as indicated by P wave velocity measurements and actually some other measurements that we've taken at the site too. Um, and that these, these reductions have sustained for over three years uh, at the site that we still have access to. Um, looking at the results of the, the shaker truck testing, uh, the excess pore water pressure versus shear strains, um, we don't see a notable change in the excess pore water pressure between untreated and treater soil, treated soils. And we suspect that this is because we weren't able to impart sufficiently large shear strains, uh, cyclic shear strains at the depths of interest um, and potential to enhance this uh, through an embedded soil anchor um, for future research. All right. And that's all that I have. So thank you, everyone. Oh, and of course, sorry, just acknowledging the many folks that worked on this project um, near, from near U, Texas, um, Arizona State University, um, and then our graduate researchers as well and industry partners. So thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you for the wonderful presentation, Professor Diane Malk. So next presentation will be from the Professor Neda Kukunski. Uh, Rutger, Rutger University and talking about uh, the shaking the bridge. Yes. Uh, can you see it well? Hello? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Look at well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak a little bit about the use of large mobile shakers in bridge evaluations. I would certainly like to acknowledge the people who have contributed to the projects we conducted, and those are listed below. Okay, it's moving. Uh, so I will be speaking about three potential applications uh, in the use of large mobile shakers in evaluation of bridges. The first one will concentrate on uh, the use of shakers in structural identification, where we can say we can set the goals, evaluation and monitoring of condition or performance of existing bridges. I'm saying bridges, but this could be used on other infrastructure assets and also how we can use those results maybe to improve the design of future bridges. 
Uh, the second application will be related to the evaluation of the significance of dynamic soil structure interaction effects on the dynamic response of bridges. Uh, this discussion will be limited to the effects stemming from, well, let's say, traffic loads, not earthquake loads. And finally, an application in the evaluation of unknown bridge foundations. First, let me speak a little bit about what was the motivation to initiate uh, this research. We are doing quite a lot of condition assessment of bridges using non-destructive evaluation technologies and the technologies. And here you can see, for example, how we are doing evaluation of concrete bridge decks using a series of different ND technologies. We are also doing those evaluations using a robotic system like this one, which integrates multiple technologies. So what is of interest when we are doing those assessments, uh, we are trying to assess the condition with respect to the state of corrosion, state of delamination, concrete degradation, maybe assess vertical cracks. And uh, as you can see, what is highlighted here is something that was uh, probably a special motivator delamination. So what delaminations are, if you are not familiar, in concrete bridge decks, those are predominantly uh, horizontal cracks, which commonly develop on the top riba level and ultimately lead to spalling. And this is a major issue on which uh, state DOTs are spending annually billions of dollars to repair bridge decks. So what we have observed during testing of several bridges is that um, uh, some of the bridges had extremely strong dynamic response when heavy vehicles like this one were passing over the bridge. And uh, uh, on this particular bridge, for example, in Iowa, when we conducted the survey, what came out of this survey, delamination, which is commonly a result of corrosion of rebars, um, when you look at the map at the bottom, which uh, describes the corrosion activity map, we had very few signs of corrosion. But on the other hand, when you look on the top map, the elimination map, we had many signs of delamination. And this led to the conclusion that this delamination formation had nothing to do with corrosion. It was pro probably a result of this high deflections, high dynamic response due to passing of heavy vehicles. And we said is, oh, it must be also important to know what are dynamic characteristics of bridges. So let me speak about the first two applications. So structural identification and dynamic soil structure inter interaction effects, how we can evaluate those using large mobile shakers. So the first project we conducted was uh, with the support from NSF and as a part of the testing, we evaluated this bridge in uh, Hamilton, New Jersey, Hobson Avenue Bridge. So here you can see what was the bridge deck, and also you can see uh, the location of pier, which was of the highest interest to us. So uh, pier in the medium. The objective of the objectives of this first test were, first of all, to demonstrate how we can use large mobile shakers and in particular T-Rex uh, to carry out these low to moderate magnitude shaking to evaluate the response of bridges. To, uh, we also wanted to use the project to capture and uh, develop a little bit better understanding of what is the significance of dynamic soil structure interaction effects on bridge dynamic response. Uh, we were very much interested in, since designs are typically done with the assumptions of that uh, bridges are sitting on a rigid uh, surface. Um, so what kind of difference we get in uh, the bridge response when we include dynamic uh, uh, soil structure interaction effects versus assumption of rigid base. And finally, uh, we want to see and this is very clo closely related to those NDE issues, we wanted to evaluate what is the effect of superstructure characteristics on bridge deck performance. So the first question somebody might say is, well, uh, uh, structural identification is being done. So why we should use large mobile shakers? If you look at the bottom of the graph, conventional structural identification, where we use small electromagnetic shakers, uh, what we can how we can describe that 
type of testing is that it is low level demand testing where we are overcoming first overcoming forces from some non-structural components and some unintended composite actions. So really to overcome those and to get very good relationship between uh, induced vibrations and the response of the bridge, we really need something with much higher force levels and large mobile shakers can deliver it. So this is how it looked like on uh, the bridge itself. You are in a moment, you're going to see a video of the actual testing. So we very much liked that we had an opportunity to have T-Rex because of this um, ability to shake in all three directions. Uh, we were primarily interested in the frequency range of 15 uh, to two Hertz. And uh, what we also examined, we examined uh, uh, how the bridge responds to different load levels. So we had seven load levels in three kip instrument increments, so from three to 21 kips. Certainly to measure the response of the bridge, uh, there was heavy instrumentation on the bridge, uh, uh, a large group of geophones and accelerometers was placed on the bridge deck, on the pier, and also we have placed some geophones on the ground. So this video will show you how did it look like in practice. So this is the bridge to span, still go the bridge. In a second, you are going to see T-Rex entering the position for testing. As it is in the position, it is going to lower down the base plate. And you are going to see how it is uh, inducing vibrations in uh, horizontal. So this is in this case transverse or lateral vibrations and also vertical vibrations. So and you can also see that it is going from very high frequency to very low frequency. So from 15 to 2 hertz. Uh, the response was measured by a series of geophones. And I have shown uh, the plan. So here you can see those geophones and accelerometers. But probably if you would like to see that there was a response of the bridge, I hope that you will be able to see on your side uh, the movement of water in this water bottle. So this is how, and we certainly felt it very, very well as we were working on the bridge. In addition to this, some secondary elements like these traffic signs, they were uh, showing clear signs of vibrations. So um, here you can see what, uh, and these are superimposed uh, time histories from those seven levels of load. So you can see that uh, in terms of the shape, they very well match. Something what we can say is that um, uh, we certainly observed nonlinear behavior, which means that doubling the load was not uh, doubling the response. It was probably about tripling response as we went uh, to the highest load. This slide illustrates why a large mobile shakers are so good. Um, so what we I have already mentioned is how when we use small electromagnetic shakers, uh, we real, really are not fully relating our, our loading to the response. And uh, this can be best uh, illustrated through the coherence, which represents the relationship between the response and excitation. When uh, those are very strongly correlated, coherence is close to one or 100%. When they are not, it goes down. And you can see that, for example, this red line for 13 kilonewton uh, load level, that we have lost coherence, especially in a low frequency end. On the other hand, when we go to the high end of our loading, 93.4 kilonewtons, you can see that black line on the top is, is 100%. So we need high intensity loading. So we were looking into the spectra to response spectra to see what kind of uh, interesting um, uh, resonant frequencies we can observe. On the top is horizontal response due to horizontal shaking. At the bottom is vertical response due to vertical shaking at mid-span. And you can see that we are identifying uh, a different set of frequencies. 
So we were very much interested in those resonant peaks for uh, horizontal shaking. And we wanted to examine those by comparing the results from our experimental study with the results from numerical simulations. So we did finite element simulations using com uh, COMSOL multiphysics. And in these simulations for the, uh, the sphere in the median, uh, we, have, uh, we have introduced impedance functions. So we had these complex springs, which were illustrating uh, dynamic response of, of the foundation. So we also wanted to compare what kind of uh, result we get if we, if we take into consideration dynamic soil structure interaction. And when we assume that we have a fixed base model, so a rigid base. So in general, we, could, we can say is that our models could uh, match pretty well uh, the results we collected in the field. Uh, it is a little bit hard to see. I don't know for whatever reason, uh, the image changed colors of those lines. They look very similar, but there was a little bit uh, better match between the model which incorporated dynamic soil structure interaction, those impedance functions. So to explain why uh, this is uh, this matched a little bit better, we also explored eigen modes of this particular bridge. And of special interest to us was for this lateral shaking, these two modes. Uh, the first, what you see, mode number four, first lateral swaying mode and first lateral rocking mode. So we compared the, those modes for the fixed base and DSSI model. Before I show those plots, just to show that the model matched pretty well, uh, pretty well the experiment. So for example, for DSSI model, when you look at the frequencies obtained from the model, they are within 5% of the frequencies obtained on uh, during the measurement. So comparing the mode shapes for the DSSI and fixed base models for the first lateral swaying mode, it looks like they are pretty much identical. Even frequencies are extremely close. The same is for first lateral rocking mode. Frequencies are close and the mode shapes look very similar. But when we ran simulations of T-Rex shaking um, and you look at the response, you can see that there are significant differences. The fixed base model simply did not, did not capture anything related to lateral rocking mode. And that is what we expected, that there should be no response since there is no rocking flexibility of, of the foundation. It is rigid based. Uh, I spoke about uh, why, uh, what motivated us to, to start looking into uh, the dynamics of bridges. So we also used these results to explore a little bit what kind of difference it makes for the stresses in uh, our concrete bridge decks and um, whether we were taking fixed based or DSSI. I would say that stresses, whether it was horizontal or vertical shaking were of about the same level, so no significant differences. But then we went to the next step, and that was now when we have a validated model, we said, OK, um, if we are not happy about the levels of stresses which we, we have in this concrete bridge deck, we don't like character, we don't like the dynamics of the bridge. Uh, what would happen if we change the dynamics of that bridge? So we went with different scenarios. And here you can see one scenario that instead of existing steel girders, we had, for example, some four, uh, other girders, let's say four times stiffer girders, which could be, for example, uh, let's say pre-stressed concrete girders. And as you can see here from the comparison at two resonant frequencies, for I think this was second, um, second bending mode, uh, that we had for the four times stiffer girder model, we had significantly lower deflections of, of, the, of that bridge deck. And when we looked into uh, levels of stresses, there were significant reductions in levels of stresses, whether we were talking about, like on this chart, longitudinal normal stresses, or on this chart, 
transverse normal stresses. And finally, what we think might be the most uh, important uh, stress component for formation of delamination for meso stresses. And you can see that by having these uh, uh, much stiffer girders that it significantly reduced von Mises stresses. So let me go uh, just maybe an another five, six slides. Uh, let me speak about a different project where we used um, uh, T-Rex shaker for evaluation of um, for evaluation of dimensions and uh, some estimation of bearing capacity of unknown foundations. So when we are speaking about how we evaluate or how we estimate dimensions or bearing capacity of unknown sh shallow foundations is we can say that we have to use very different scenarios uh, depending on what information is available or what information is missing. However, in all solutions, we have to rely on uh, matching of the experimental response data with those from the simulation model. So for example, and I'm going to show the first case, for example, if we would like to evaluate foundation dimensions, uh, what we have, for example, used, we have used information from the shear modulus uh, profile or shear wave velocity profile we have obtained. And also from we have used uh, peer column dimensions to make our initial estimates of the footing dimensions. But at the end of the day, we have to match experimental uh, uh, response from the one from the simulation model. So here is the, the bridge which we have tested and you can see also in this graph the peer of interest which was on shallow foundation and we wanted to estimate what are the dimensions of, of the footing of this peer. So what we have done in our testing is we have placed uh, T-Rex directly above the pier and in, induced vertical vibrations. So while we have conducted some other measurements, what was the most important for this evaluation was that we also had a couple of geophones which were directly attached on the pier, close to the bottom of the pier. So from here, we could say this in a way represents the response of the foundation. Before we started uh, uh, T-Rex testing, we also evaluated shear wave velocity profile using SSW testing, so manual testing. And here you can see that this velocity was anywhere between two, uh, 250 to about 500 or 600 meters per second. So without entering into going into details, how this was a little bit different modeling than we have used for the first Hobson Avenue bridge. Um, but ultimately what we wanted to do is we wanted to match the results or the response from our numerical model with the results from the field. And here you can see, for example, a matching of time history uh, between the two. So just as a single illustration, so how we estimated what is the width. Maybe we can start with the statement at the bottom that the information we had that peer column was, uh, well, we have measured peer column. It was nine feet by two and a half feet. So you may say that it's probably very reasonable to assume that uh, footing might be extending maybe two, three feet from, from that column. So based on that, we assumed foundation length of 15 feet. We have used in our analysis the, uh, the assumption of that depth of embedment is eight feet, and we have measured and we used shear wave velocity of 350 meters per second. So the objective was, when we said is we are going to match the results uh, from experiment and numerical simulations, we were looking into matching of two things. The first one is measured resonant frequency, and the second one measured amplitude of the response at that resonant frequency. And uh, to, uh, to evaluate uh, resonant frequency for numerical, uh, for numerical model, we have used eigenvalue analysis. And you can see, for example, 
what were the values when we assumed that the width of the footing is anywhere from 7 to 12 feet. Similarly, you can see on the right side that um, uh, we have evaluated what is the response from the numerical model. Those red lines represent what was the measured amplitude of what was the measured resonant frequency. And you can see what uh, we have obtained from those. Uh, because this is a fairly narrow range of amplitude, so these points are actually not too distant. You can see that the measured amplitude was, um, uh, was 0 0.545 inches per second, while uh, uh, we are having all of these points within uh, between 0 0.53 and 0 0.59. So uh, uh, we could say it's probably the points which uh, satisfy maybe a little bit better uh, both criteria were those three between seven and nine feet. And uh, later we have learned that um, uh, the foundation width is actually eight feet. So at least what we can say is that um, uh, we were able to get pretty close to the actual dimensions. So let me end with a few conclusions. Uh, what we think that uh, large mobile shakles are really having great potential and, and are effective in assessment of the dynamic characteristics of bridges, including the uh, evaluation of the significance of uh, the SSI effects. Uh, something uh, what we find very important is this ability to introduce uh, significant loads. And we have seen from the tests that increasing the load magnitude improves coherence. And we can say because of that, we are more confident about uh, the identification of dynamic characteristics. Um, uh, our analysis from uh, which incorporated the SSI effects uh, shows that uh, there is, uh, by when we incorporate those effects, that, are, that those models are capturing a little bit better dynamic response of bridges. And finally, uh, we can say is, uh, that based on we have done, this is still a very preliminary work. There is still so much, but based on what we have done is we strongly believe that evaluation of, for example, dynamic stiffness or dimensions or bearing capacity of unknown foundations using large mobile shakers is a very promising one. So with this, I uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. So I know, like uh, the Ian Robertson, he he's not here. The professor from the 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 University of Hawaii, uh, Ma Manoa, and and I heard that there's some people really interesting about the shaking the bridges. So it will, I hope that it will help them to understand that that what is the the capability of our shaking. I would like to say one more thing, Nanad, before we move on, and that is after that, I think. I don't know, Brady, if you were still here, but we, no, no, uh, it was here at the university, sorry, when we were doing this, we have had Liquidator and T-Rex together, and we've cycled, it wasn't a full bridge, because it was just out, it was a quarter scale, but we've cycled, cycled a bridge bent, so statically now, uh, but loading it and measuring everything until it cracked. So okay. that's with them stationary, but with the hydraulic winches on the front of each one. So we could have, but we didn't know it then, pulled, probably wouldn't want to do it, but pulled the bridge a bit over, you know, had them down in the median and pulled the bridge over statically too. So not a lot, I don't mean that, but just to get another sense for another type of movement or another type of loading, sorry. It just, I hadn't thought about it before I saw your presentation, but I think there's, yeah, that's why it's good to also talk more because other, we've had quite a bit of experience since and some not so good and some good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so next presentation will be with Dr. Uh, Dr. Br uh, Professor Brady Cox from the Utah State University and talking about the subsurface imaging using the DAS, the distributed acoustic sensing. Okay, thank you uh, everyone for being here and participating in our workshop. We 
you know, we've been trying to give ideas uh, that might prompt uh, investigators uh, for, you know, coming up with their own research projects uh, to use this equipment. And specifically, as we've said, this is for opportunities related to research that might be done in Hawaii. It's pretty rare that we would get the opportunity to take one of our big shaker trucks, T-Rex in particular, to Hawaii because of the costs of transportation. And so we're trying to take advantage of the fact that, you know, those shipping costs will be will already be covered by the existing uh, project. So our at Neary at U-Texas, we have three main thrusts of our science plan. One of those thrusts has to do with in situ nonlinear testing of geomaterials. And that's what Diane talked about in terms of the in situ liquefaction tests with T Rex. Uh, our other, uh, another thrust area of our science plan has to do with um, dynamic soil structure interaction problems. So, uh, testing of, of structures and the, the foundations and soils that they're founded on um, together with our large mobile shakers. The third thrust has to do with subsurface imaging, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, Peter Hubbard was not able to join us today. He was going to take the lead on a presentation, just so you didn't have to hear too much from the, the Neary at U Texas PIs, but um, he was unable to, to make it at the last minute. So I'll be uh, giving a presentation. Um, most of which I've put together with help from Peter. And then I just want to acknowledge some contributions from two of my recent PhD students, Joe Van Tassel and Michael Hughes, who have also been helping us with um, some of the subsurface imaging we've been working on over the past year using uh, DAS in the near U Texas mobile shakers. So what is distributed acoustic sensing? Some of you might be very familiar with DAS and some of you might be hearing about this for the first time. So real quick, distributed acoustic sensing is just a way of measuring strain in a fiber optic cable. It's based on laser interferometry. And we're, we're basically just looking at the phase change and phase could just be associated with a time lag for a given frequency. So we're looking at phase changes for these pulses of light that we're sending through the fiber optic cable. And if you haven't seen these fiber optic cables, you can imagine if you were to pull out one of your hairs, uh, which I don't recommend, Professor Stokey. Uh, <laughs> oh, I had to throw that in there, right? <laughs> or Nanette even, I see you smiling, Nanette. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Anyways, if uh, you know, they're the fiber optic, uh, the fibers are very, very small, and we're sending a laser pulse down that fiber for sometimes distances of kilometers, and we're using Rayleigh backscatter, so subtle um, discontinuities or imperfections in the fiber reflect light back, and we're measuring the the phase across something we call the gauge length of the fiber. And this gauge length is important. We'll talk about it later, but you can think it think of it as the region that we're measuring strain over. And that's on the order of a couple of meters to maybe up to 10 meters or 30 meters even. So we're just using the light and how it's bouncing back and forth in the cable to measure strain. And there's some equations down here that I'm not going to get into right now. We use something that we call the interrogator unit or the IU to send those pulses of light down. And so uh, near at U Texas, as Professor Stokey mentioned, we have an OptiSense ODH4 plus interrogator unit, and that would be available for people to use um, on any projects that they might propose. Uh, in conjunction with our equipment. So why DAS? Why are we interested in using DAS instead of, say, traditional uh, instrumentation like geophones or accelerometers uh, for measuring uh, vibrations? Well, the ability of DAS to, to sense seismic wave field mm -hmm. over large spatial scales, like kilometers, while still maintaining high spatial resolution is one of the reasons why, that's probably the primary reason why we want to use DAS. So literally, you can make measurements over <laughs> kilometers, tens of kilometers even, with this high spatial resolution. Our interrogator unit, the ODH4+, Plus, we can have a one meter channel separation, and we can record up to 10,000 channels. So if we were to do a one meter channel separation, we could 
record at one meter spatial resolution over 10 kilometers. That's pretty incredible. Now for near surface imaging purposes, which we do for engineering, uh, oftentimes we're not recording uh, those dynamic signals over that, uh, those large of distances. Here's an example of a source correlated shot gather from our uh, truck Thumper, mm -hmm. which was operating at the middle of a 200 meter long uh, fiber optic cable. And so you can really see a lot of great detail here. We have the one meter channel separation. In this case, we've used what we call a gauge length of two meters. I'll talk more about that later. But we can get really high quality and high resolution uh, dynamic signals. That's why we use DAS. The, I'll be talking briefly about each of these four recent publications that we've been working on with the co-authors I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the presentation. The first one is quantifying the surface strain field induced by active sources with DAS. And so really you could think of this as a comparison between geophones and DAS and how well can we actually measure amplitude and phase with DAS in comparison to uh, geophones, which we're usually more comfortable with, at least in our previous experiences. The second paper discusses using DAS for 1D MASW, multi-channel analysis of surface waves to develop 1D shear wave velocity profiles. This third uh, paper talks about using DAS for pseudo 2D MASW. So it's not true 2D, it's doing a bunch of 1D MASW and stitching those profiles together to generate two-dimensional subsurface profiles. And then the last one, we haven't quite submitted, but we're getting ready to submit it to a, a special edition um, of the Journal of Geosciences has to do with using DAS for true two-dimensional imaging using full waveform inversion, or FWI. So multi-directional shaking with DAS. We've done some interesting studies over the past year and a half at our Hornsby Bend test site. And we've been using T-Rex because it has the triaxial shaking capabilities uh, to perform three-dimensional tests and so here's a, a DAS array down here. This one happens to be 200 meters long. It has two cables in it. We, we were testing two different types of cables. We were te testing a, a NANSI strain sensing cable. It's specifically meant for really good uh, coupling and strain sensing of infrastructure. And we were using that uh, in comparison to an, a cable from AFL that's just called a tight buffered cable. Both of these cables actually ended up performing very well for very good measurements of ground strain, but we also installed them very well. We did some, some small, some shallow trenching with a, just a, a trencher for like sprinkling systems. We trenched that uh, little cable, we, we put the cable in the trench and, and recompacted and buried it. And so we anticipated getting really high quality measurements because of the care that we took in installing the fiber. We also had a 100 meter array of vertical and horizontal geophones. So we had um, 48 vertical geophones and 48 horizontal geophones, four and a half inch geophones. The horizontal geophones we placed in line with the direction of the fiber so that we could measure inline shaking with the geophones as well as inline shaking with the fiber optic cable. A lot of this data is published in an open access data set on DesignSafe and I've listed that up here for those of you who might be interested. You can download this data, including the geophone and the uh, DAS data uh, from DesignSafe just by going and searching for this publication. So let me show you some of the experiments we've been doing um, for both what we call off end shots. So those would be in line with our arrays, but off end anywhere from a couple of meters to 40 or 50 meters away from the beginning of the cable. But we were also doing broadside shots where we were parking T-Rex 50 meters or 60 meters away from the cable and then shaking vertically in line. This is sheer longitudinal and shear transverse. So at both the off end and the broadside shot locations, we can record waves on the DAS. And what you see up here in the, the top row, this is when we're operating vertically 
in the off end configuration and we're shaking vertically in the broadside configuration. And there are certain reception patterns that we expect on the DAS. The DAS is only sensing strain in the longitudinal direction. Now there's some cross sensitivity and these waves that we initiate here will be propagating at angles. And so they will have a component that's in line with the fiber, but you have to understand how to interpret the signals from the DAS. Um, as especially if you're trying to make engineering measurements of amplitude. It's really important to understand these reception patterns. And I'm not going to talk a ton about this, but the off-end configuration would be used for testing like MASW, seismic refraction, full waveform inversion. And then, for example, if you wanted to test in the broadside configuration and shake in the longitudinal direction, that would be appropriate for doing something like love wave tomography for example. So there's a lot of different really interesting things you can do with the multi-shaking components of T-Rex and looking at DAS in lots of different imaging applications. I'm mostly going to focus on the off-end uh, stuff today just because that's the simplest to understand. So here are some seismic traces, some wiggle plots. Um, where we've got time plotted along the vertical axis and distance um, along the fiber optic cable or along the geophone array. On the, the far left, we have the signals recorded with the DAS uh, NANZ cable. And here we have the signals recorded with traditional four and a half hertz geophones. Um, the, the DAS data was collected using a two meter gauge length. That's the shortest gauge length that we can use. So we're averaging the signal over that two meter uh, spatial length, but we can separate our channels every one meter. And so you can see that these lines are grouped a little bit more close together than these because the geophones were spaced every two meters. In fact, you can probably see things a little bit better looking at the sledgehammer signals. And you can see that the data in my opinion, just looking at these two plots, comparing the, the DAS with the geophones, you can see finer details in the DAS data, in my opinion, um, just because of some of the tighter spatial resolution. And so we've been able to get really, really high quality signals with our DAS interrogator unit. And by taking care to bury the cable, cable appropriately and making sure that we're using a cable that's meant to have really good coupling with the soil and the fiber. Um, I'm gonna zero in on this little section of the shot gather right here for T-Rex shaking at 20 meters off the end of the fiber. When we do that, this is published in the Hubbard et al. paper, the first one I mentioned. These are comparisons between the NANSI cable in blue, the AFL cable in black, and the geophones in red. Now we had to, we're looking at comparisons in terms of ground strain for amplitude. So we had to use two geophones in order to calculate strain. So there were some calculations that needed to be done to go from raw voltage to particle velocity. From particle velocity, we had to integrate to go to displacement. Then we had displacement at two different geophones. So there was a lot of calculations involved in getting these signals to be able to compare with each other, but the comparisons are actually quite remarkable. The geophones are sensing point measure, you know, their point measurements, and the DAS is a distributed uh, strain sensing measurement. But what we found is that when we took care and we really took into account the, the calibration factors for the geophones and did everything the way we should, that we could get extremely good comparisons out to this is 45 meters from the source, this is 125 meters from the source, where we can get really good comparisons between the DAS and the geophones. In fact, in this Hubbard et al. paper, we basically just said that what I just told you, <laughs> we get great comparison between geophones and DAS. Um, there is a really important factor related to wavelength and loading direction when comparing DAS versus geophones. So to make a long story short and not get into too much of the math, um, when you're, if your wavelength divided by your gauge length is less than a ratio of one, you won't be able to accurately measure phase. 
So your the wavelengths and the frequencies that you can sense with DAS are very sensitive to the gauge length. And so our gauge length for our interrogator is about the minimum gauge length is two meters. So you would only be able to measure wavelengths down to about two meters accurately in terms of resolving phase. Now, resolving amplitude is even more complicated. And it has to do with the equation of this transfer function down here. But to, to make a long story short, your, your wavelength to gauge length ratio needs to exceed at least a factor of three if you want to measure accurate amplitudes. And the amplitudes are also sensitive to the, the response direction of the loading. For example, if you're shaking vertically, generating Rayleigh waves and P waves along the, the fiber, and then in this case, you would be measuring what we call off-end response at this zero azimuth right here in this direction. So what this is showing is that unless your wavelength to gauge length ratio is approximately five, you're not going to be making the, the same strain measurements with distributed strain that you are with point strain. So you just need to be careful and make sure that at least for engineering purposes that you understand the importance of loading frequency and wavelength. That might be a little bit more in depth than people wanted to hear for this presentation. Um, here are some example dispersion data that we've extracted from the waveforms that I showed you previously. So if we do a two-dimensional Fourier transformation on those waveforms, we can compare the dispersion data that we get from geophones versus the NANSI cable versus the AFL cable. These white lines were chosen from the fundamental mode and the first higher mode of the dispersion data calculated from the geophones, and they were superimposed on the dispersion images from the, the NANSI and the AFL cables. This is for T-Rex shaking vertically at a, a source offset of negative 40 meters. And you can see that there's really good comparison between the dispersion data extracted from uh, both types of receivers. Now, the cool thing is, is we don't have to do any processing. We can calculate dispersion from the geophones without, you know, just using the raw voltage that comes out of the geophones. And we can calculate dispersion from the NAND-Z just using the, the raw, the strain units essentially. And we can get the same dispersion data even though we have completely different units because we're looking at relative um, normalization of amplitudes and phases. This is an interesting comparison where uh, for T-Rex shaking, at a source location of five meters and shaking in line with the cable, generating Rayleigh waves by shaking in line rather than vertical. So the dispersion data is different than what I just showed in the previous plot, but you can see that the geophones and the NAND-Z cable, if we use a gauge length of two meters, the dispersion data looks almost identical. But when we use a gauge length of 10 meters, so we're averaging over 10 meters instead of two meters, we have a lot less uh, bandwidth on our dispersion data. And what we proved in this paper is that, you know, the gauge length that you record your waveforms at is really, really important to the, the frequencies or the wavelengths that you can resolve dispersion data uh, from. And in fact, the gauge length is a limit on the, the, the shortest wavelength Length that you would be able to resolve or the highest frequency that you would be able to resolve from dispersion data. So there have been some studies in the past that haven't showed the best of comparisons between dispersion data extracted from geophones versus fiber optic cable. But part of that has had to do with the fact that they've been using interrogator units with really long gauge lengths. And because of that, they, they can't resolve very high frequencies or very short wavelengths. So here's just a comparison between three different modes of dispersion data we extracted at the Hornsby Bend site from geophones that are colored, the dispersion data is in blue. And this is the plus and minus one sigma uh, range of the phase velocity data. And then the, the pink, which is kind of difficult to see because it's just overlaid on uh, from the other ones. And the green is from the, the AFL. So we have geophones phones, DAS, and NANSI. And you can see that the dispersion data for at least three modes that we extracted was very, very similar 
between both um, fiber optic cables and the geophones and that those those comparisons are very good then from that uh, dispersion data you can then perform your inversions, which I'm not going to talk about, uh, to get your 1D shear wave velocity profiles. And when we do that, we, of course, try to take into account uncertainty in uh, the dispersion data. But this is a, a typical analysis that we might do to get 1D shear wave velocity structure. Um, so for the cool thing about DAS is it, it makes it really easy to do something we call pseudo 2D MASW. Now there are problems with pseudo 2D MASW, don't get me wrong, but if you're going to do it, it's pretty nice to be able to do it with DAS because you don't have to play the, the typical game like we, we do with, uh, for example, geophones on a land streamer, where before you, you know, at this, while you're at the site, you have to make a decision about the spacing of the geophones, are they going to be one meter apart? Are they going to be two meters apart? Are they going to be five meters apart? You know, I only have 24 or 48 and I have to choose my array length. You don't have to do any of that with fiber optic cable. Once the fiber, op fiber optic cable is in the ground, it makes it really, really flexible because you can decide during post-processing what lengths of arrays you want to use and what channel separations you want to use. And so you're recording the entire length of the cable with every shot that you're making. So at Hornsby Band, we used 32 different shot locations along this 200 meter uh, fiber optic cable. And then we also had some invasive data. We had, uh, what is this, seven, I think, CPT or nine CPT locations. And then we had two borehole locations. So we could perform imaging and then compare the results we got from imaging with the borehole and the CPT data. So I'm not going to get into this too much because I, I noticed time is short, but we performed pseudo 2D MASW with different array lengths. We call these subarrays. So we can break this 200 meter fiber optic cable into, for example, 47 12 channel subarrays, 44 24 channel subarrays, or 38 48 channel subarrays. And the ones that are shown here are we've stacked them in this direction just so you could see, but they would all be overlapped along this same line. Essentially, every four meters, we slide the array, we process it like it's a 1D MASW test, and we keep marching down the line uh, using different shot locations. So when you look at the dispersion data in terms of frequency or wavelength, and you look at the 12 channel arrays, which are shorter, these are like 11 meter long arrays, these are 23 meter long arrays, these are 47 meter long arrays, you can see that the wavelengths or the frequencies you can resolve with different lengths of arrays are, you know, governed by the, the length of the array. And in fact, you have a, a much shorter bandwidth when you use shorter arrays. And that has an impact on your inversion results. Now, keep in mind with geophones, you have to make this decision ahead of time. You have to decide, you know, how long is your array going to be and how many channels is it going to be? And then you have to collect all of your data like that. With DAS, you can, you can play around with this after, during post-processing. Here are some results from our, our 2D uh, subsurface imaging, and I'm not going to explain a lot on how we got these, but the top plot is for the 12 channel arrays, and the bottom plot is for the 48 channel arrays. And you can see the these two images are not the same, meaning your choice of subarray length is going to impact your 2D velocity image. And that's really not good, actually. Right? Like you would like to be able to develop an image of the subsurface that's the same, no matter what you chose, you know, for your acquisition parameters. But there's reasons why they're not the same. And what you can see is that the 48 channel arrays had a longer bandwidth, which allowed us to look deeper into the ground and resolve deeper structure. And in fact, the these little sticks right here are uh, 
borehole lithology logs from um, borings that we drilled along the length of the array. And you can see that shale is encountered down here at about 13 to 14 meters in both of these boring logs, and that the results from the 48 channel array were pretty good in agreement with those borehole logs, and that that they weren't in such good agreement with the 12 channel array results. But if you were looking, for example, for the depth of CPT refusal, that that might be, you know, easily indicated by using a 12 channel array. The, the, the point is, is that you need some invasive measurements to calibrate what you're looking for at the site. And if you're looking for this, the depth of CPT refusal, you might be able to use one type of array. And if you're looking for the depth of shell, you might want to use a different length of array, for example. So, okay, I'm going to skip through this really quick to just say we've also done true 2D imaging using full waveform inversion of DAS data at the Hornsby Bend site. And we're using a software called Salvus which is a commercial software. It's um, uh, developed by a company called Mondaic um, AG. They were affiliated uh, early on with uh, ETH um, in Switzerland. The, the full waveform inversion of DAS is a little tricky. Um, right now, as far as I'm aware, Mondaic might be the only company that's developed um, a procedure for doing it. We're still solving the elastic wave equation in terms of displacement, but they've reformulated the adjoint source to take into account the difference between um, DAS is measuring strain rather than displacement. So there's some adjustments you have to do in order to solve the full waveform inversion process. I'll just leave it at that. So we used all 32 shot locations to do the full waveform inversion. And I'll flip back and forth between some of these just so you can get a sense for the different waveforms we're collecting at different locations along the array. But we, we have to use a cutout around the source. And there's reasons why we do that. We don't want to use near field data essentially in our, our full waveform inversions. But for every one of these shot locations, we're going to be solving and trying to match the um, theoretical waveforms with the observed waveforms. So we used four different starting models for our full waveform inversion. This is something that a lot of people don't show and maybe they don't want you to know, but yeah. full waveform inversion is very sensitive to the starting model that's used. And all of these starting models were site specific. This starting model was developed from our 1D MASW results. This starting model was developed from downhole testing that was conducted in one of the boreholes at the site. This starting model was developed from some machine learning uh, stuff that we've been working on. And this starting model was developed from the 2D MASW survey as I showed you previously. And here's just an example from the 1D MASW data. Here's the starting model. After running through the full waveform inversion process for this bandwidth of 10 to 15 hertz, we were able to update the subsurface model so it looked like this. And you can see that the green lines were the simulated waveforms for the starting model, and the red waveforms are the simulated waveforms for, the, for this model at the end of what we call stage one. The waveform misfits went from a number of 15.3. Don't worry about that number. <laughs> All you have to know is that it, it went down approximately, it was halved through the first stage of full waveform inversion. And you can see that the green waveforms up here are not replicating some of these ripples, especially later in the wave field. But by the time we'd run through stage one, we're starting to get better approximations of the observed uh, waveform. So we have to go through this process like four different times, gradually increasing the frequency bandwidth, trying to get better and better resolutions. And uh, we're starting out trying to resolve deeper structure in stage one and eventually shallower structure in stage four. And at the end of this, after using all four starting models, MASW, downhole, 
the convolutional neural network, and 2D MASW, we were able to achieve pretty similar misfits with across all of the waveforms between our simulations and our observations. However, these are the two-dimensional shear wave velocity profiles that were, were resolved from full waveform immersion. And so you can see that they're in the top 10 meters or so, they're all pretty similar, right? But once you get below 10 meters, the impact of the starting model is quite obvious. And in this case, the convolutional neural network and the 2D MASW starting models were able to more closely replicate the known subsurface conditions from the, the borings. So with that, let me just mention that we're working on 3D subsurface imaging. This is, I'm going to show you a really quick YouTube video from uh, a drone that we took some footage of last uh, May. We we're conducting a 3D imaging project with Dr. Kim Tran from the University of Florida. But this pattern right here that's kind of crazy, this is a DAS fiber or fiber optic cable. And there's two kilometers of fiber optic cable that we zigzagged back and forth across this site on like a five meter grid. And so we have two kilometers of fiber optic cable in a, an area that's about 150 meters long and about 70 meters wide. And then every one of these dots is a three component nodal station, some of our smart solo stations. And every one of these X's is a shot location from T-Rex. So we have 2000 channels of DAS. Every, every single meter across this site, we have a DAS recording and we have over 250 shot locations. And in each shot location, we shook in all three directions. So this is a very, very unique data set. And we'll soon publish this data set on Design Safe so anyone can, can look at it. But as I get ready to close, I just wanna show you a little drone footage from this. Can you still see my screen? Can I get a thumbs up from someone? Okay. All right. So this is that site and the drone's about to rotate to look in line with the direction of the that image I was showing you previously. So all of these lines represent where we trench the cable into the ground. And we installed the DAS cable um, in a couple of days. I mean, it took us a while just to survey it out. And then we rented a trencher from, you know, Home Depot or something like that, just a little sprinkler. Trencher. And we trenched all of the lines and then we went along and laid the cable and we compacted the soil back into the trench. The trench was only, you know, less than six inches or 15 centimeters deep. And then you can see T-Rex here on site and uh, it's driving in between these different lines shaking. Oh, the reason we were doing this project is because there's a lot of voids at this site and we're looking for those voids and karst features in the limestone. So this is a, uh, we haven't, we're just starting to process the data from this site. It's, um, there's a lot of data. We'll, we'll just say that. Okay, I'm going to stop there and just close by saying that um, DAS is a powerful sensing tool. And when you couple DAS with the active source uh, multi-component shaking of T-Rex, for example, makes for some really, really cool research areas to, to do subsurface imaging, whether you're looking at 1D, 2D, or 3D. And we look forward to supporting your DAS research in Hawaii. If anybody has any ideas they want to propose to NSF, let us know how we can help. Thank you for the presentation, Dr. Cox. I know there's a few people interested in it, but well, there are their research areas like a DAS. So I think they I, they will be really, it will be helpful to them. <laughs> so now I will start the question session. So I'll put it, okay, so wait a second. So I will go through the first, I know I have like a chat, there was a, a question and I, I think Dr. Cox already answered. So I'll start with that and and I will get the question from 
from Professor Yangshen. Just give me some moment. So the question was the, the clarification of Dr. Silky's point on fund for Adam proposal to the existing volcano project or funding potentially available from NSF for fuel travels, ETC or that need to be provided by the individual PI. Okay, so Dr. Silk, oh, Kato already answered, but please uh, correct me, Mang, if I'm wrong, but those money will be, the NSF fund will, if we budget it, then they will support those, those costs, right? I don't know. Where are you reading? Yeah, yeah, those are. Let's just so I think Dr. Yeah, so I can mm -hmm. just comment on this real quick yeah. since I read read already. Mm -hmm. But the there's two different directions you can go. If you're applying for funding from NSF, the the costs of the equipment are cheaper. It doesn't mean that you can only use NSF funding, but it's cheaper to use NSF funding. So you have to be aware of that. If you write a proposal to NSF and it's funded, I mean, obviously in that proposal, you're going to work with Sung Moon. He helps you develop a budget. And in yeah. that budget, you're going to say, how many days do we need to use the equipment? What types of equipment do we use? How many personnel days do we need? Um, all of those things are going to be budgeted in the NSF budget. And NSF will fund the cost to pay for the fuel for the T-Rex, they'll fund the cost to pay for the, the NERI at U-Texas personnel travel, you know, their, their meal per diem and their hotel, and it will fund any shipping costs, right? Like if you need to move T-Rex from the Big Island to Oahu or whatever it happens to be. So if you're using other funding, then you have to come up with that money somehow, and our, our rates are going to be higher. So you need to talk with Sung Moon because it will be more expensive if it's not an NSF funded project. It, it won't be more, you're talking about the people's time and everything. If it's not an NSF project, they have to pay everything. Yep. They don't get, they don't get our technicians. They don't get any of that. They, for, cause we're funded to have technicians out there but only on NSF projects. Yes, correct. Yeah, like I said, if, yeah, if yeah. it's not an NSF project, you're going to have to pay more money. It doesn't mean we don't want to work with you. It just means that it's more expensive. True. True. And it comes after NSF projects. It, it's, it, it's, it's in a different category, but oh no, because when I started, even with Nice, I started this, it, we weren't really fully funded by NSF. And so we did, and it was on one of my early slides about industry too, that absolutely we work with industry and we need to do some of that every year to keep everyone funded fully. So yes, we do both, both of those. And just like Brady said, you need to talk with Fan Yu or me about it uh, as the PI and the person responsible for paying everybody. Uh, I need to know about what's going on. I think that'll be answered those questions. So, uh, Professor Yang Xian, yeah, you, you can you can you can give me, give us uh, questions. Oh yeah, uh, thank you for the uh, wonderful uh, introduction and uh, presentations. Uh, I'm a seismologist at the University of Rhode Island, so I've been working on uh, earthquake activities and uh, volcano structures in Hawaii since uh, 2018 uh, eruption. So my question is mostly related to uh, instrument de de deployment. So uh, first to the for the DAS, um, the Professor Cox, you mentioned the, the uh, improvement in quality if the cable is buried uh, in the ground. But uh, I suspect in Hawaii this is going to be a uh, challenging. <laughs> so it, what is the so, so even if the cable is laid on the surface, would that still get a decent, useful data? So, yes, some data. You just can't can't expect it to be as high of quality. Um, but yeah, there are definitely restrictions, and you know we didn't talk specifically in a lot of detail about the the project that's actually going on in in Hawaii. We wanted to let people reach out to the PIs of that project if if they're interested to know the details. But 
Professor Stokey can speak more to this. There's there's going to be no digging, no pushing in spikes, no trenching on the volcano. Um, you know, other areas. Well, no one's going up on the volcano with these other people. Now, USGS has got a lot to do with this too, and you know, they're really the main. We're coming along as a source, but the rest of the stuff is under control of USGS. I understand that. Of course, we are, if we are doing experiment on the uh, US on the national park, of course, we need to talk to the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. Uh, you mentioned no spikes, even for the for the nodal seismometers. Is that is that true? Is that only in the area where the um, NSF project is going to happen? The 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 project led by University of Miami or anywhere on that on the on the volcano. I park. think I think in no. You need, we can give you, it's, it's not Dan, it's Roger. Yeah, Roger Dillinger and, and Daniels right, now. Yeah, but Roger is the guy in charge. Um, you'd really have to talk to those people. I know they spent a lot of time getting permission just to do what we're doing. I mean, a lot of time. And, and all I'm re repeating is what I've been told because they want us to do some SASW testing since we're there and we've got our equipment. In, in some of the areas, but we can do nothing but put a geophone on the surface. That's it. Nothing can stick into the ground. And okay. you you'd you'd have to work with the Hawaiians to, to know all the constraints. Okay, okay. So what, what we are thinking to do is no different from uh, what uh, this uh, this project is going to do actually. So in terms of deployment. Uh, not a, not on their side, of course, but uh, in a different part of the oh, of, of the big island. Yeah, on the big island. Okay. So we'll, we'll talk more uh, uh, for details later. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And and Ivan Wong, who's on their the line. I mean, he we did a lot down around the ocean without any trouble. I mean, mm -hmm. putting things in the ground and all that sort of stuff. Um, and we plan on doing some more uh, other types of testing that you've heard about over there. And so we'll just see how that works out. Um, like site, you know, we do a lot of cross hole testing with T-Rex to get maybe even to get material damping now. Uh, so in terms of projects and, and where we want to head and learn about these materials, but it's not on, not on the, not in the volcanic park and not on the volcano and so forth. There's very, very strict constraints. Right, understandable. So you, you said you have done some tests. Uh, um, the signal propagation distance is of course related to attenuation, but from you, the test you have done, so how far the signal you, you can see? Uh, you're talking to me now? You're uh, talking about DAS? DAS or... Either DAS or the uh, nodal seism seismic record. Yeah, so. I mean, so T Rex is a sixty thousand pound vibe, so mm -hmm. it's the, the biggest vibe you can you can get. Um, okay. So you you can see the waveforms a long ways away, um, especially if you're stacking, and and so it's it's uh, you know it's as good a quality a source as you can. You can use now the one advantage that some ex oil exploration companies have is they would synchronize five or six of them together <laughs> but you know it's in terms of an individual fiber sized truck it's as, as powerful as you can get so yeah we have we have one so i didn't name them all but uh raptor is another one that was given to me from uh but work on for work on Yucca Mountain, and it came to the University of Texas. But it's not near as uh, strong. It's only say that vertical part. Raptor is a hor Saturday. Rat Rattler is a horizontal shaker. I didn't describe those because they're not going over there. 
but they're not near the quality and capabilities of of T-Rex. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Sure. Uh, you can check out Simon. Simon yeah. Clamper has a publication about using T-Rex in uh, Winnemucca. Let me let me I'll, I'll find the reference. I was testing the ref uh, I'll test the reference. Simon Clamper used T-Rex for this type of test test before. I okay. think it's about one mile. So I'll I'll text the publication that I can find. All right. One Thank thing you. I I would also say when we were doing with Thumper, when we were doing work with Thumper, um, in some of the places, uh, you didn't propagate very far because it was so full of holes, let's say porous. I mean, and and uh, maybe we were discussing it, or another person on the line and I, and we're looking over, I'm looking over at the, at the uh, uh, highway cut, and I could put my arm in oh, as far as it would go on the highway, cuts, horizontally, huh? just full of holes or tubes that that cause tremendous attenuation when you're right at the ground surface. So it depends is a good answer. But it, it, you're not going to get, as Brady said, you're not going to get more out of it than, uh, than T-Rex right now. Mm -hmm. There is another big machine being made, uh, Brady, not too far from us that uh, we haven't talked about. It not, it's not operational yet, I don't think, but Cecil found it. And, and also there's one comment about the, the fiber on the, the trench in the surface from the and Andres uh, uh, Chavarria. So he said, like, yeah, they're gonna be see a different between if there's like a surface, and I think I think you can talk. Sure, talk. let them talk. Yes, please. I unmute you. So hey, hi, <laughs> hey, hi, everyone. This is Andres Chavalia from Optasense. A yeah, very good question on the coupling is certainly as as, as Brady mentioned. Uh, you don't need to trench it too much to to get very good coupling, and we'll, we'll get good signals. But we have acquired a lot of data in suboptimal conditions, basically the fiber just on the surface. And uh, we have done this in mines, also some roads, some pipelines. Uh, one of the advantages of the, of the distributed sensing that, that Brady alluded to is that again, you have such high receiver density that even doing certain denoising of the data, uh, you have a lot of uh, capabilities because you have, you're, you're, you're very well sampled temporally and especially that 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 helps you a little bit when you have uh, unusual uh, noise trains uh, contaminating your data. It's, it's not optimal, but I think the, by the nature of the technology, you're always gonna have certain coupling because we are distributed sensors. So over, over those two meters of fiber, you will have certain coupling to the ground that you can you will be able to denoise to a degree. Uh, thank you. And also like Mong just, Upload the the link, yes, and then and Dr. Oh, Yang Shen get it. So, all right. So, do you have any other questions from the audience? And I'm sure you can call or email or whatever any one of the speakers who would be happy to chat with you. Um, and I hope the folks from Hawaii. We have a couple. Yes, I think well, I compared um, they, the If they have any comments they would like to make, we would be well. We we'll welcome them. Someone. But what, I, I, I think asked, she have left. Huh? Okay, I asked you to to check on, and and you did mm -hmm. the cost of moving. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. The Ohio to Ohio, so it's like four five hundred. $4,500? Yeah, just to give you a sense for moving just one way to another island. Um, and then we'd have to see how that changed the cost bringing it back. But that's a starting point. So we're not, it's 10 times as much to get it over there. Right. And I think there is a desire to see other NSF funded research going on as a part of all of this activity. 
I can't say it any other way. I'm not within NSF, so if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but that's not my sense, just for the record. Yeah, I think the Hawaii, Hawaii people are, are a little dirty. That I thought okay. one, one person joined. And if you know anybody there, or if you feel you have a contact, please contact them. Yeah. yeah so we have a question from. Oh, we got quite yeah. a few hands. Yeah. Uh, Several. Kali, Kali, Kali Yost, right? I think we'll start with her. Yep. Hi. Um, my name is Kaylee Yost. I'm Kaylee. starting a job as an assistant professor at Penn State in about a week. So, um, uh -huh. congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the workshop. So my question is about what kind of support you have through uh, the NERI at UTexas site for um, like data processing for those of us who may not be super familiar with how to what, what to do with the data that we actually collect in terms of converting from voltages and signal processing and things like that. Is there support through through Texas to do that? Or is that something that would need to be done kind of in-house by the PI? You wanna say anything? I think I'll, Brady, you can go after me. I, I would say, you know, at that point, from what I glean you're trying to ask, and that is then let's say you wanted to know the shear wave velocity profile at a few sites and we're going to go over there and collect the data, but you're talking about people reducing the data. Um, I think at that point, it probably would be that you would be have Brady as a co-PI or somebody else as a co-PI. I would be a co-PI. Uh, others could be um, that would help you for a limited amount. But um, I think also you need them if you haven't ever gone out in the field and so forth with this, you need these people with you to help you uh, move along in the area that you want to try to learn about. And that's fine. I'm, I'm sure Brady would do it, uh, be delighted to do it. We would be delighted to do it, but to help you if that uh, is a possibility. Is that what you were thinking? Do you think that fits with what you were thinking? Yeah, I mean, I just feel like um, as someone who's never collected data with a fiber size truck before there's probably a learning curve <laughs> oh that's no no if you know what to do with the data i mean if you've got seismic data or something you know what to do with it no we can handle the rest so you, we'll, we'll get it for you Excuse we, we me, do please. have kaylee we do have some like python scripts for example that that would help people for example you know, we're not going to leave you stranded and say, here's some raw DAS data in units of phase, right? Or something like that. So we're going to help you get that converted to whatever units you need. The same would be true with geophones. Like we have to calibrate our equipment, um, the geophones. And so there's a response curve that has to be applied to cal, you know, take voltage and convert it to particle velocity. And Mung, Fanu Mung has developed things over the years. We've developed things over the years. So, you know, we generally try and help our investigators make sure that they get the data in the format they need. And then and after that, they're kind of responsible for, for doing the, the processing. And if they need additional help, like, like Ken said, if it's going to be a lot of involvement, then there might be something like a, a co-PI role. But it just depends on the level of involvement. And, and you should know, are we on now? And you, you should know also, we do work, Brady does work in the nuclear business you know, nuclear power plants and things like that or where they're going to be built. So all of our equipment is is goes through NQA1, Nuclear Quality Assurance, level one calibrations multiple times a year, typically. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite unusual that, but we've evolved into that. I, I started that 25 years ago. I mean, we've evolved into that um, and and it's very important. Yeah, I think it's it's today th things are are first rate. Yeah, All hands. Yes. I hope I hope that answers your question. So next will be Senadi from the UCLA USGS. Hi guys, thanks for organizing all of this. 
Um, I know, Ken, you've already disclaimed it, but do you have any indication from NSF's end if they have like a target of, it's a timeline through which you're going to include different projects? Because I think the original NERI email said through like June through August or something, or it's a budgetary constraint or a number of projects constraint that are be piggybacking onto this, or it's just it's just all up in there right now. Um, I there are no real constraints. I think NSF is a willingness to try to see what could be done here, because this is a rather special opportunity to help the Hawaiians. Um, and, and it'd be nice to involve some of the Hawaiians in what's going on too. So I, I mean, I think that would help help the project, help the project that you're proposing. But there, it, it's just a special opportunity. And, and if other people can benefit by it and Hawaii can benefit more by it, NSF is for it. And, and I think you're going to see other people try to maybe get another federal agency or something else also involved, you know, to help fund things. You you said what I needed to hear, so okay, okay, and <laughs> thanks. And we'll try to help you anyway. If you call anybody that's talked, or they'll all try to help you. For sure. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it as always. Sure, you're very welcome. We got yeah. one. So the next question will be, yes, yeah, sorry for the pronunciation, Zio Zhao Wei. Hi, uh, uh, I'm Xiao Zhao Wei. Uh, I'm okay. not sure if you can hear me. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, right, can hear uh, you. Okay, I'm right on site at AGU. Uh, could be noisy. Uh, and thanks again for everybody give us this wonderful workshop. Um, I'm a student supervised by Dr. Yang Shen at the University of Rhode Island. My question is like, uh, uh, first of all, is, is that uh, the proposal we try to submit to NSF have to only use like active source? Can we like submit a, like a active source and combine with passive source? If that's the case, the how long can the DAS and the noodle, uh, I mean stations last? I mean, how long can we leave it in the field? Um, oh, our, yeah, our, our sensors. So you're talking about if you wanted to put a DAS system down and leave it there? Yeah, it's kind of a, because technologists, we want to both recall active source along with a responsive source earthquakes. So you wanted to also be like if you were on the volcano, you wanted to record what the volcano is doing? Exactly. Um, they're not using our DAS system. So the the they, they use the 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 smart solo. So and that 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 battery life will be like one month. Is it correct? Is it correct, Robert? Yes, uh, the smart solos are rated for thirty days. Okay, thirty days. But like, when we submit kind of proposal to use both instruments. I'm not both instruments. I mean both kind of sources, like um, active and passive. Yeah, we, we regularly, we do, I, you know, I only talked about active testing, but we do, we do passive testing as well. And obviously there's going to be some limitations because it's Hawaii. Like we can't leave our equipment down there for many months, more than likely, but we're willing to talk with you on a case by case basis. And, you know, what, whatever you can get funded through NSF, we'll have to consider um, but those discussions need to happen ahead of time, you know, with with Professor Stokey, with Sung Moon, with myself. Yeah. Or with Brady. Whether we want to leave our DAS down there for three months, for example. Only if you oh, are you married? I'm I'm sorry. I just need to know. Are you married? Yeah. Because you'd have no, to no. pledge your firstborn to give up if we lose our DAS. <laughs> I just want you to know this. Uh, uh, so, because you're going to be. Oh, uh, just run back. <laughs> I, I should have recorded that. I'll just run back that. to my country. <laughs> this is recording. This is recording. Sir. This is recorded. Yes. It is. Oh my gosh! I'm sorry. No, but I mean, even when Brady had the DAS out there, we didn't hire the policeman in in Florida, though, did we? Fine, we, we didn't, did we, Brady? No, we no. didn't. But we were worried. 
<laughs> did you I sleep in the well trailer, sure. Brady? Did you sleep in the trailer? Um, I can't remember. Duh. <laughs> I don't recall. I believe is the correct <laughs> word. <laughs> oh my goodness! There's no such thing as too much fun. Oh boy. No, we and Brady has got the best background. <laughs> It, uh, call him and see what he has to say about some of this. And he's, you know, he's a part of Neary at U Texas. I'll talk to, for the details maybe after the workshop. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Yeah, yes. Uh, another question from. Yeah. Yes. I just wonder whether well, there would be a meeting. Um, follow-up meeting to discuss uh, the details of the yes so uh, I, I will send you a like a survey and they have uh, uh there's like a like a question that if you want to discuss more you can yeah you can uh, make a comment and i will make the the zoom uh, zoom meetings with the ut uh, or the near at ut personnel so yes you i think I'll, i will send it out right away so you can you can answer it okay we have, thank you yeah, we really are working for you right now. I mean, uh, that's our job. And uh, if you get funded, you're going to make us look good. Uh, so we, we're trying to be, we want to be very supportive. And we like to see the equipment used this way. We'll, we'll do our best. <laughs> Thank you. So is there any more questions? Okay, then thank you all for joining us. And Ooh, it's so and, not bad. We're only 10 minutes over. Yes, we just were or just 10 minutes over. Thank you guys. And, no, thanks for the interest. Yeah, no, this video. Thanks, Brady. Thanks everybody for their presentations. Diane's gone. Oh, no, Diane's oh yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> Diane's busy. <laughs> See you everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, thank guys. You. Bye -bye. Thank you guys very yeah. much. And Ed, thanks. Thank you, Professor. Diane, thank thanks. you for the other presenters and sharing oh, your, yeah. sharing thank your you very much for the opportunity to speak. No, thank you, sir. Thank you for joining.